Good evening, this is James Cook, Assistant Professor of Social Science at the University of Maine at Augusta, and I'm recording this video for our undergraduate criminology class. In this class, we will be taking a look at uh, pre-classical views of crime, classical considerations of crime as a rational act, and some criticisms and empirical problems with the idea that crime is a rational act. Let's think, though, back to pre-classical times, before crime really was thought of as a crime in the modern sense. Uh, we often find ourselves, when we're confronted with a killing, a raping, a robbery, a theft of some property, uh, we're in our American society, inclined to think of this as a crime. Uh, and the thing to do would be to call the police and involve the criminal justice system. But it hasn't always been so. Hundreds of years ago, uh, such an act would be considered a challenge to the integrity of a family uh, or to the integrity of a group or a community if it was coming from outside the community. And the response would be retribution, often a similar act. So if one's own property were taken, you take someone else's property. If someone from your family is killed, you kill in return. If there is a rape in your town and it's engaged in by someone from another town, you go and you rape women in another town. Uh, this can lead to a response that's a cycle of violence uh, and retribution that, while perhaps ultimately self-regulating, can lead to a lot of uh, instability socially. And so at some point, the idea of a universal standard to which would be applied uh, to people of all families, groups, or communities uh, was introduced. And this was at a time when the church was a powerful institution, and so, with the church as a powerful institution, uh, the standard became religious widely in Western societies. And so, what would the response there be? It would be a response from an institution, the institution of the church, uh, doing some somewhat informal regulation through confession, but often through inquisition and occasionally through crusades, entire wars taking place across continents, uh, in which the act that is offensive is some form of sin against a religious standard. Uh, if violation of religion becomes the offense, then in a sense the rejection of uh, not just God in general, but the particular God of your country, becomes the heretical act, and diabolical forces at work must be responded to. It's in response to these two tendencies occurring before what's been called now the Enlightenment, that the Enlightenment... Uh, authors, and really activists of their age uh, reacted. Uh, and slowly, the idea of taking what was an offense against a group or a god uh, and turning that into an offense against a society began to take root. Thomas Hobbes, uh, in a very famous book called Leviathan, uh, suggests that the way to rationally solve these feuds, it's like solving a puzzle, uh, is to place one power above all, and that one power has the sole legitimate authority that they can delegate to others to uh, punish. Citizens make a deal. It's a rational deal that they trade obedience for protection. The ruler's might alone makes them right, but that is a willing uh, a price that many are willing to pay in order to obtain order. It's a possibly arbitrary standard, however, 
And it's one that we'll see Beccaria, uh, or Beccaria, depending on how you pronounce his name, which version of Italian you, you follow. He revolted against in his personal life as well as in his um, uh, academic life. Against the background of the French uh, strivings toward revolution, with Montesquieu and Rousseau suggesting social contracts, in, in which people make deals with their government in order to obtain order. Uh, Beccaria, he's revolting against uh, what's called a patria potestas, which is the arbitrary rule of fathers over children. Thomas Hobbes would not have a problem with this. Uh, Beccaria did. He wanted to get married to a particular uh, woman that was deemed undesirable by his father, and he rebelled against this. And he also developed a little bit of empathy for others who are resisting that arbitrary rule. And he said, after marrying for love against his father's wishes, and after becoming somewhat reconciled with his birth family, he says, let's apply this to others. Let's set out a uh, rule not by God, not by group, not by might, but by law. And in this, he's followed by uh, Jeremy Bentham who says, well, if we're going to set up laws, we should do so according to some principles. And these principles uh, start from the idea that human nature is understandable, that people do things for reasons, not because they're possessed by demons, or not simply because they're members of a group. And if we can just understand what those reasons are, then we can behave in a way as rulers, as legislators, as members of a democratic society in regulating human conduct so that crime is diminished. Crime becomes a matter of law, uh, and law is a human creation designed to solve human problems. It's deeply humanist. It's an enlightenment view um, coming out of the Renaissance and developing forward from there. So the idea of rationality suggests that hum if human beings are rational, that means they're able to calculate in their head what will happen if I do this. They'll be able to deliberate if they're hedonistic, that is, if they, there are certain things they want, and they'll go for those, and there are certain things they don't want, like pain or suffering or humiliation, and they'll avoid those. And if they have the ability to choose, if they have free will, then they should be able to respond to something called deterrence. And this is the uh, real focus of uh, Beccaria, also of Bentham, and those who follow in their classical footsteps. The idea is that through deterrence, you should be able to prevent crime. By doing what? Okay, let's return a little bit to Hobbes here. By threatening punishment if you engage in an antisocial act. In other words, we are much like uh, possibly bad dogs, and we must be trained. How do you train? You do it, if you've ever had a dog, by being certain. You always follow through, especially when the dog's learning. You know the dog has to know they can't evade. And, and if they know they can possibly get away with it, they won't listen to you. It has to be severe punishment, but not too severe. You don't. Your goal is not to hurt the dog when you're training a dog. Your goal is not to just engage and severe punishment for the sake of severe punishment, ideally you don't actually want to hurt the dog unless you have to. Clearly, if a dog did something really nasty, hurt a human being, it would have to be put down, but you know, if you can avoid that, you would. And so the key for a dog owner is to find a punishment that is severe enough to counter the pleasure of the act that the dog didn't want to engage in. Well... The idea is that people are like dogs, right? So you'd want to have severe consequences to counter the pleasure involved in crime. 
whether that pleasure was um, the enjoyment in carrying out an activity or enjoyment of the proceeds that you would get in, in the case of a property crime. It also has to be swift. Uh, you know with a dog they have very short-term memories. They don't have a long-term memory, so you can't wait more than, you know, really ideally 10 seconds before you uh, let a dog know what they did wrong and give them a punishment to counter it. Otherwise, they won't learn. Now, people have longer uh, memories than dogs, but according to these Enlightenment thinkers, it's not by much. So you need to have some kind of swiftness. It's also called celerity, so that it would um, sound like certainty or severity, uh, really, mostly. The idea is that people won't notice the connection between the punishment and the crime if authorities wait too long. People lose their focus. Now, if you're going to engage in deterrence, there are really two kinds of deterrence that you might uh, want to engage in. The first is specific deterrence, and we'll look at some specific deterrence questions later. This is punishment to stop future criminal acts by the offender. If there's a particular person, a particular dog in this case, that's been doing wrong, you act out against that individual to show them that particular person or that particular dog, what happens when they step out of line. General deterrence is really having to be a visible act. It's a public act. Think about public hangings, public execution, public amputation, public ridicule, public shaming. The whole purpose of this is to stop future criminal acts by showing other people what happens. When you hear the phrase, we're going to make an example out of you, that's general deterrence. The idea isn't really to stop the future behavior of that individual uh, who already committed the act. In fact, if it's a capital offense and they're going to be executed, the whole question of stopping them from doing it in the future and having them learn their lesson, well, learning the lesson is beside the point, they'll be dead. The goal is to send a message to everybody else. And that's where we talk about general deterrence. So everyone else behaves, and they never get in that person's shoes who was so clearly punished. Does deterrence work? Now, we're going to start by looking at some really private acts of punishment. This is supermax, uh, which is solitary confinement. It's something that nobody else is going to see other than guards. Uh, and it is something that is done to people where they are put in a lockdown where they don't really get to see other people. And there have been a lot of studies that have shown that this is something that has a really strongly punishing effect upon people. Uh, people can lose their mental balance. They, they feel as if they don't know how time is passing. They say they report that this is uh, akin to some kinds of mental torture. Uh, very few people are fond of supermax imprisonment. But the argument is, uh, at least one argument is, that this is necessary in order to keep uh, those prisoners in line. Okay. There's a second argument that says, well, we just need to warehouse these people. We need to keep everybody else safe and just stick them somewhere. But there are arguments that have been made that say, well, Supermax is a great way to teach long-term prisoners, you know, the error of their ways, and then when they get out, they'll do better. Well, some people actually do get out of Supermax, and those people can actually get out of prison altogether eventually. Uh, David Lovell, L. Clark Johnson, and Kevin King studied the recidivism uh, within three years by release supermax prisoners and and it was 53 percent it was pretty high now they also looked at some other inmates who were released they were non-supermax prisoners they'd never gone to supermax and their recidivism rate was 50 46 percent excuse me 46 percent recidivism is defined uh, in your readings 
Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, obviously the Supermax people are more dangerous. That's why they went there in the first place. Clearly, that's why they're going to have a higher rate of recommitting felonies when they get out. But the really clever thing that uh, Lovell, Johnson, and Kane did was they matched uh, the non-Supermax prisoners to make them look like the Supermax prisoners. Now, I hope you can see this, because this is actually table one from their paper, in which they describe all the characteristics of the Supermax inmates. Um, you know, the, the, the portion of them that had a really violent offense, uh, or a drug offense, how many violent crimes they had had before, how much recidivism they'd had before. Uh, they had a, a escape attempts. How many violent discipline reports that they had in prison or defiance? How many years were they in prison? These are all things that are associated with super maximus, right? So what the authors did was they took the unmatched sample and they picked and chose and sorted people in and out of the sample until they had a sample that had the same characteristics. You look at that first column and that third column, they have the same characteristics on violent crimes, on escape convictions, on disciplinary reports. So these are also really hardened criminals, and yet the non-supermax prisoners have a lower recidivism rate even when they're matched so that they are just as hardened criminals as the supermax prisoners. So this is suggesting that the imposition of supermax is not teaching these folks a lesson. It is giving uh, prisoners some kind of effect that leads them to be more likely to commit a crime. What that is is not clear. Uh, here's another study that does similar matching, supermax incarceration and recidivism. In the Florida Department of Corrections, we're talking, you know, 1,241 supermax prisoners and 1,241 non-supermax prisoners also matched for all these characteristics. Uh, the violent three-year recidivism for supermax uh, inmates is higher than for the matched uh, non-maximum uh, security uh, prisoners. And for all prisoners, it was much lower than that. So this is the opposite of the deterrence effect. There might be other reasons for it, but it's not matching the deterrence model in which those who are more harshly punished are going to have a specific deterrent effect, specific, which says that those individuals are going to learn their lesson. And rationally speaking, they're going to say to themselves, gosh, ha, I've been scared straight. I know now not to do this. Okay, uh, we can move on uh, and look at property crime recidivism, same pattern. The supermax uh, prisoners are the most likely to engage in property crimes. So, what about simply the act of incarceration versus some alternative uh, treatment for sex offenders or alternative sentence that is less harsh? Uh, Kevin Nunes, Philip Firestone, and their colleagues, you can see the citation right here, take a look at sexual offenders and those who are uh, sent to prison and those ones which are not, which are diverted. And even when they control for similarities in offending and similarities and all kinds of other characteristics, they conclude, and I quote, sentencing sexual offenders to terms of incarceration, sending them to prison or jail or what have you, appears to have little, if any, impact on sexual and violent recidivism following release. Okay. That's the opposite of a deterrent effect. What about felony uh, offenders in general? Uh, a 2002 piece of research in the journal Criminology by Spohn and Holleran. Uh, again, not a small number. 1,530 convicted of fel uh, felony offenders in Missouri. They, the offender sentenced to prison. 
uh, even when you take other background characteristics into effect, have higher rates of recidivism, and they engage in acts of crime that get them back in the system more quickly than offenders that were placed on probation. So it seems that the idea of imprisonment as punishment, which is coming from the classical uh, school, our prison system, our judicial system, our criminal justice system is based on this classical system. It's at odds with these research results. Uh, William Bales and Alex Becquero, in some very recent research published just last year, they're taking a look at 79,000 offenders sent to state, state prison and 65,000 offenders sent instead to something called community control, which is a diversion program in which individuals are closely monitored, but they are kept out of prison. Uh, so Bales and Picciaro take a look at recidivism at one, two, and three years, and they find that controlling for all kinds of effects, uh, similarities of the individuals, similarities in their acts, that just being imprisoned increased recidivism, increased the rate of reoffense compared to lesser punishment, to not going to prison. It seems that prison is doing something else besides uh, deterring uh, inmates from committing crimes in the future. Uh, finally, a really interesting case. You might know about uh, a sheriff, Joe Arpaio, in Phoenix, Arizona. He's a very colorful figure, and you can have an opinion about him. Pretty much everyone does. He's the fellow you might know about who has in inmates wear pink underwear. He puts them in tent cities that are really hot. He has individuals who are arrested and being processed in the system, even going undergoing a jail cam, which is where you know they're being processed, their stuff is being taken. The, the pictures of them are being broadcast. Uh, there are chain gangs. You know, this the idea is literally with chains and things. The idea is to shame uh, as a punishment. So in 1998, he commissioned a study to say, hey, now that I've put these policies into effect, let's see if the recidivism rate is lower after I've done all these shaming things because... Sheriff Arpaio says, I think this is really going to have an effect. But, interestingly, there seems to be no difference in the type of recidivism or the rate of recidivism, according to Mary Griffin, a criminologist at Arizona State University who carried out the study between the incarcerated criminals who were uh, in the system in Phoenix before Arpaio's uh, uh, policies took effect, and those that were present after Arpaio's uh, punitive measures take effect. It doesn't seem to affect uh, the propensity to commit crime again. No deterrent effect. So, if there's no deterrent effect, and you might think, well, that doesn't make sense. Some of you may be thinking that there's a distinct possibility that it doesn't make sense. Are human beings rational? Do they fit the assumptions that were set uh, by Beccaria, by Bentham, by Hobbes so long ago? Well, certainly, we're, many of us are hedonistic. Uh, are we able to calculate? Do we calculate? Well, what will happen if I do this? Are we really able to choose? Do we exert free will? Or are we driven by something else? What is it? Dahan and Vos, in your reading for last week, talk about this. They interview street robbers. And, you know, if you look at the patterns that you see in there... Dehan and Vos are very uh, lengthy in their descriptions of what they think is going on, but if you just read the text of the interviews with the street robbers themselves, 
they express a lot of difficulty in explaining why they do what they do. They say, sometimes in the moment I just did it. I didn't know why. I I don't know why. Or if they eventually come up with a, an explanation, it's after they stumble. They often report acting on impulse without paying any heed to the danger involved. And that, that's something that just happens in this situation. They report having conflicting feelings about how they were doing. They, they, they're not sure what was right. They have trouble calculating. They explain their conduct not with a reference to needs. I wanted this. I needed that. Occasionally they do, but more often with reference to identity. This is who I am. This is who I want to be. Or sometimes this is not who I want to be. And therefore, I'm not going to do this, or I won't do that. I might rationalize what I did uh, on the basis of how I am going to be in relation to other people. And a lot of the difficulties that you saw in those interviews were reflecting these psychological struggles that people had inside their heads as they were trying to recast their behavior as socially acceptable, that somehow it was all right what they did. Um, but clearly it's a behavior in which they're trying to rework the thinking they had about it in order to fit after the fact, after the original decision. This is not rationally driven criminal behavior. It's irrational. What they're describing is irrational behavior. Uh, there's a really interesting article that's not about crime, but it is about telling stories. Uh, and this is by Douglas Mason Schrock when he studies transsexuals who are preoperative and are talking about the emergence of their idea of a true self. Now, I'm not talking about transsexualism as a crime, but I'm saying let's consider crime or criminal, street robber, to be an identity to be a label that you stick on yourself. Like you might stick on yourself, ah, I'm a transsexual, or I'm a Republican, or I'm a Democrat, or I'm a hunter, I'm a New England Patriots fan. Any really strongly held belief, and there are some people, you know them, who are really strongly New England Patriots fans, is something that you have to work at in order to really uh, have it affixed to your true self. One thing I hope you noticed in uh, the Dehan and Vos article is how much those street robbers in the interviews weren't just talking to the interviewer. They were talking to each other. And when they were talking to each other, they were working out their stories with each other. Sometimes they were disagreeing with each other, trying to convince each other and get their story together, get their story straight. For Mason Schrock, he would agree with the Hunnan folks. He'd say, yeah, you know, I'm looking at transsexuals. A lot of what's happening when transsexuals are talking about their experience, they're talking about their past, is they're creating stories. And they're working their stories through. And they're putting it together so they can make sense of where they were and where they are now and where they're going uh, in a way that's coherent. For Mason Schrock, he says, the whole idea is that people are in this search for their true self, something that is an authentic representation of who they think they really are, what their status is, what their identity is. And the idea is that stories emerge over time to help identify people's selves. And the events of people's lives are massaged and changed and altered and emphasized and de-emphasized in order to fit that story, the story that changes. Mason Schrock finds for transsexuals who are talking about these things over time. He spends a lot of time listening. He notices the stories change. And over time, they begin to pay more uh, close resemblance to one another's stories in a group and that they start to match a master account. This one account that seems to be a template for a lot of people. You have to get yourself into that account if you're going to somehow make sense of yourself as a transsexual. Uh, if you don't, you may come to terms with yourself 
as uh, fitting some other status. Uh, Mason Schrock writes, in learning to tell different stories about themselves, in learning to tell the stories, transsexuals learned to be different people. This happened only because they encountered the transgender community, a community of people who were also telling stories, and used to learn and adopt those storytelling tools. Uh, many of the people who critique the rational idea of criminology, uh, the rational school of criminology, say, look, what you find when you find criminals are people telling stories about themselves. They may be in a criminal community. They may be learning to tell its uh, the story, the master story of a criminal community. And that may make sense. So if stories of transsexuals or of criminals are out there, they might be not these super accurate, punctilious reproductions of the details of the, their past choices. That's not the idea. The idea is that the stories they tell are symbolic. They're affirmations of the group identity. The things they choose to talk about affirm who they are now. Uh, and that's why they talk about the stories in that way. This is all after the fact. It's all after the choices have been made uh, and things have happened. People have done things. The idea is that we rationalize after the fact to make our past fit the outcomes that led to our present. So if you believe this, if you believe uh, Dehan and Vos, if you believe Mason Schrock, then studying the way people form these identities as criminals in the first place, come to think of themselves as criminals, come to embrace their criminal acts, and come to think about doing that in groups, becomes very important. Uh, it becomes the idea of forming a subculture in uh, the next chapter of Walsh when he's talking about social structural theories. And if you can somehow predict how those stories will come out and how groups will come together, where people are going to start telling stories to one another and making sense of their lives as they live them, even though they may be deviant subcultures, then you're going to be able to predict when and where crime will occur. The really ironic thing, then, is that the people who do this sort of work, the positivists, uh, are using rational methods. They're using scientific inquiry. They're using careful measurement, using it to predict irrational outcomes.